Please welcome back Miguel Gomez. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll start with kind of a big question, since it's a big film. Um, can you talk about the impulse to combine the real and the imaginary, which is sort of what defines this film in many ways, this uh, combining documentary material with the structure of the Arabian Nights? Yeah. Uh, I think to make, a, to try to make a portrait of uh, a certain place in a certain time, like uh, Portugal nowadays, it's not uh, enough to show what is happening. I mean, I think you have to show what is happening and some real, real people that has stories to, to tell about the experience of living in that place at that time. But I think you have also to put uh, other stuff and this other stuff, it's, for me, it's so real as r reality, which, which comes from the, what people want to happen. It didn't happen, but what people want to happen. Uh, for instance, example, uh, this uh, encounter with uh, these guys from the Portuguese government and the guys, the bankers, with this uh, wizard that gave uh, this aphrodisiac uh, potion to them, I don't think it's real. <laughs> but I think that all the Portuguese shared this fantasy that even with the silliest uh, things, all these uh, measures of cutting on the pensions and the, all the things uh, people suffered, uh, they could stop. So even with a magic potion uh, for the hard-on men. Uh, and so I think to show what's happening, to, to make this portrait of the the soul of a country, you have to put what happens, what we wanted to happen, or what we are afraid that can happen to complete the portrait. And this is why, because I think that imaginary uh, comes from the experience of living in a place. So it comes from, from life. So you have to show life and you have to show what's not really happening, but uh, it has a connection with life because it has a connection with our desires and our fears. And, and why specifically the Arabian Nights? Um, obviously, there's something about the structure, um, but I'm wondering also about the, the spirit of the Arabian Nights. Was that something that you were trying to, that's something you were drawing on as well? Yeah, I thought... Have you actually read it all the way through? No. I, I don't think most no, people... No. Of course not. <laughs> there's, I think there's only one guy that read Arabian Nights. It's uh, a famous... Uh, I hope not to offend the present people here. Maybe all of you read Arabian Nights from the beginning to the end. But, uh, for instance, the writer, the Argentinian writer uh, Borges, he, wrote, he, he read uh, Arabian Nights from the beginning to the end in the many translations, there, because there are many famous translations of Arabian Nights, and he read them all, he compared them, uh, but I'm not Borges. <laughs> so I didn't did that. But uh, uh, the spirit of the book, yeah, it's... Uh, it's pretty wild. It's very rock and roll. Because it's fiction. It, even if it was Arabian Nights, it's like a compilation of tales. Uh, 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 tales, uh, pop tales uh, from popular culture in some centuries ago in the north of Africa, in, uh, in uh, Persia and India. And so, uh, but the Every translator added something. For instance, Aladdin, 
apparently he was not there. It was, uh, it was made up by one of the translators of the book. And, uh, but uh, I think that the spirit of the book is very extreme, very wild. It's like the epic books, like for instance, the Bible. It's also very rock and roll, the Bible. Um, and so it's very extreme. And I, I thought that this uh, kind of wild and sometimes very surreal feeling, uh, very, I mean, it's, it's very, it, it had a connection with what I was seeing in Portugal, which was pretty, pretty much wild too. It was uh, extreme, so uh, the situation, the so social situation, the economical situation in Portugal uh, gave birth to uh, stories that were very uh, extreme too, very dramatical or very um, surreal too. Uh, and so I had, uh, I, I've seen this connection with the book and uh, I, I had this uh, uh, desire of telling what was happening there with these tools, these tools of the fiction of, and of wild fiction, of rock and roll fiction. Can you talk a bit about the process um, of making the film, shooting, and then also editing it um, and finding the shape of the film? You, I know you shot for a year, you, besides your crew and like a group of actors that you had, ready to work with you, you also had a team of journalists who were sort of looking for stories. Can you say a bit about how they worked and how you worked with them? Yeah, it was like a small factory. Uh, so what we have was time. Uh, we defined a, per a period of time to, to make the film. It would be in between September of 2013 and September 2014. And we had this group of journalists uh, gathering information, coming to us ev every week, saying, okay, what is happening this week is this and this and this. And we thought if it was good material to uh, transform that into fiction for Sherezat to tell the king. Uh, so we had uh, this uh, office in Lisbon, but and cars waiting for us. We were a little bit like the firemen, you know, that have poles. I wanted really to have a pole for the crew when we thought it was important to go out of the office, to go into a pole like the firemen and to rush into uh, wherever uh, we need to be to uh, film, to film. Um, and so it was pretty chaotic. Um, so because we knew, we, we never knew what we would have to shoot. It would be impossible to predict the final form of the film because it depended on even events that uh, didn't happen. Um, so we tried to just shoot uh, our many stories we could uh, and uh, it was like this. Uh, and then the editing, some of the editing took place during the, this uh, moment of shooting. There was uh, two editors, one of them was making uh, first drafts of the stories we have already shot uh, during this process and we were writing at the same time new stories and it was like this for one year and we had also the actors engaged uh, because uh, uh, we found them and we said okay we are going to build to e fabricate stories but we don't know which stories will be but uh, maybe you can play a character in one of these stories so we want to hire you, uh, but we never, we don't know if you're going to play because we don't know if it will appear a story where you can have a character to play. But you can appear more than one time. That's the good uh, thing. The bad thing, you can never appear. Normally you can appear one time. 
And it was like this. We, we have chosen a group of 12 actors, uh, which was very difficult because we didn't have characters. So how to cast actors if you don't have the characters? Uh, so <laughs> we decided to have uh, old uh, women, old men, young men, young women, and everything in between. <laughs> and, uh, and we found to these people and they said, yes, okay, uh, we are available. You can phone us if whenever you have a story. If you have a story, we'll be glad to, 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 to do this. At what point did you decide it would be three volumes, six hours? Uh, well, as I had this kind of uh, factory, my really what I really wanted to do was shoot and not to think too much about the final thing because it was useless, it was impossible to, to do it because uh, there were no means to do it. And so, uh, of course, there, there were bets going on between the crew saying oh, this will give a, like a 12-hour film, uh, but uh, in the end it will not be good, so we'll, we'll cut it to 20 minutes, <laughs> things, like, things like this. But uh, it was during the the when I finally stopped to shoot uh, and I, I start to edit with the two editors. I had two uh, rooms to edit and I was going from one to the other. And then we understood that we had uh, the possibility of have three volumes. I had the book, my book of Arabian Nights had three volumes and this was very important because then I could show the producer you, there's no problem because you know my version of the book has three volumes, so it it matches. It's it's it makes sense, and so I said. And the good uh, thing is we can have three very different films because because I think I can organize what I've shot in three uh, very different films, and this can be good. Uh, the viewer can see the first one which I think is the it's the restless one so it's a little bit like a, a, a roller coaster which it changes all the time you have all these characters that are restless that have, are worried with something it can be this uh, asshole director that runs away from his own shooting or it can be of course, the unemployed uh, people that are worried with their future, or it can be the 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 cockerel that is singing in the middle of the night, or it can be the union guy that wants to do something. I mean, everyone is worried, and the film is always changing. And uh, in this uh, in this first volume, uh, I'm not telling you the what's happening in the next two but it will be different i'm not telling you because i have the hope that some of uh, you can appear in the tomorrow to see the second one and so i don't want to ruin ruin the film for you but uh, but it's I, I understood at that moment when i was editing that the real film could be a journey from of the viewer through three different levels where the main character is uh, the Portuguese, and so in every volume the Portuguese will be in a different situation. So, so that scene that you just mentioned, um, I think it's significant that you op that you have in your first volume of the Arabian Nights a scene of you running away from the project. Um, can you say a little bit about that and, and, and why you felt the need to, 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 to sh show a little bit of your, your process and maybe your anxieties? And this, uh, it also seems to me like this is a, a volume that is very much about work, about the meaning of work and you know, the absence of work. And, and, and to, it seems in interesting that you also bring in your own work process into this. Yeah, and I wanted from the start to have these very different um, uh, tones, so to have something that appears much more like comedy, just next to uh, uh, you know 
people that are really losing their jobs because normally you are not allowed to do this. They say it's bad. Uh, you cannot mix these things because one is real and it's dr dramatic and other it's only a construction. It's something that you should not put together. And I don't agree with that. I think that it was important to, uh, from the start, to have all these layers because the film will work with all these different ways of uh, show reality. So this crisis, uh, artistic crisis of this director, it's also a pretext for giving to the viewer uh, like a manual, a manual of what the film will be. So this director is so uh, useless that he cannot deal with the range of the film. He, he runs away because he thinks, I maybe for me it's impossible to show reality, to show what's the problems of people nowadays in our society, and at the same time create f uh, tales that have all the elements, all the uh, attraction that the stories uh, give to a viewer. And uh, uh, I think that this is uh, the film. The film is always making this uh, negotiation between uh, showing our time today, what people are, uh, how, how is the experience of being alive in Portugal nowadays, and uh, how we can continue to tell stories because. I think it's very important even in uh, times not so happy or more uh, cruel times to not lose the, capi the, the ability to continue to tell stories. Just that. I cannot do uh, better because I'm only a filmmaker. If I was the, you know, the president of the Portuguese uh, a republic, uh, I, I'm not, and I'm happy with that. Maybe I could do more, I doubt it. But my only answer to uh, what I have uh, in my horizon is, is making films. So what I see, uh, what are my feelings about what I see, I can deal with that only by creating characters, uh, telling stories, and showing things. All right, we can take a, a couple of audience <coughs> questions. Yes? And what, what was the Scope. Yeah. I'll just repeat quickly. A question is about the shooting format. Taboo is academy ratio, black and white, and shooting here in scope. And it it's a mix of Super 16 and 35? Yeah. Well, I thought that if you uh, have a, a film called Arabian Nights, it should be big, this, you know? And uh, that means using the scope. The scope, uh, it's the epical, it's the format of epic films. Even if I use a kind of, I continue to use film, like in Taboo. Taboo was also shot in, yeah, in that case, black and white film. And in this case, I wanted to have uh, uh, 16. And normally, you don't use 16 with scope because it's, it's much more of a mess. Uh, I mean, the grain of 16 gets bigger. You lose definition. But in a way, I thought this was the film, you know, a kind of epic image or frame, an epic frame of image, and, but a poor material inside, uh, more blurred, more uh, grainy. And uh, uh, there, are, there are parts in 35, but the only parts in 35 millimeters are uh, the parts of Sherazad. He or she appeared briefly. You'll see her in the, thir in the last volume, the th third volume. Um, she got her own story, and it's shot in uh, 35. But I thought, uh, let's film the things we film in Portugal in 16, and the rich world of uh, Baghdad, of Sharazad, in uh, 35 millimeters. It's really anamorphic lenses. Yeah. Yep. 
I guess it's more of a, a comment, and you can respond to it about uh, how this is uh, this focus on workers and the sort of did you say love of people, uh, respect for people is contrasting that with uh, what we typically see in American film. I'm not sure about that, but uh, what I I feel. Well, it was very striking what was happening there because people, they're all... When we shot, uh, for instance, this last story, you have real uh, unemployed people, the Magnificent. They are really uh, unemployed people telling about their experience of being unemployed. And uh, um, for me, it, I could, it was a, a, in a moment where the unemployment... Uh, tax or what the the rate was at its uh, most it was the most the moment uh, more delicate at that uh, in Portuguese society it was very very high at that moment and um, and so <coughs> what I there was this new year uh, swim it's uh, traditional in that region and I had this idea of uh, creating the character of this uh, very eccentric uh, union guy, because guys from the union normally they don't have uh, their political project is not to convince the unemployed people to go to take a, a bath in the first of January, of course. But maybe for you know today we need more un, uh, unreasonable project. Even if his project is uh, quite uh, strange, gathering uh, all these people and... Uh, uh, I, I, I feel that the end of the film for me is moving because you can sense a hope. All these people together, m they are doing something make that maybe uh, it's not very wise or it's not very it maybe it will not help their lives but they are together they are together and they are taking that bath together uh, going to diving into the water on the first of January for that the year to come will not be so bad as the year that finished and uh, so I yeah I, I needed to to give voice to to these people. Of course nowadays, people in power talk. They are very 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 far away from the people, uh, and, and they we talk about the world by with statistics and uh, numbers and, uh, and in a way I think. Uh, for instance, I give you an example. There there is now uh, in. This Sunday there will be elections in Portugal, and uh, the two major parties in Portugal they had these uh, outdoor campaigns, and they have so the the the, the party that uh, is in the, the government had these people in the outdoors looking very happy, saying we succeeded, we uh, overcame the crisis, and then the other party they have very sad people saying uh, I lost my job I and then we, we understood that uh, these people in these outdoors they were uh, not happy not sad they were not Portuguese they were <laughs> bought they bought that images in, t in the internet so there was no connection between the guys that we saw in the outdoors and the political messages uh, there. And I think this is like a metaphor for how the power today connects with people. It's very, very, very far away. So in a way, for me, it was important to have people that uh, are unemployed talk about that, talk about what is their life. I think we have to wrap it up as we have another screening starting, but we will continue this tomorrow. Uh, thank you very thank much. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, Miguel. Thank you.